Okay, we might get started. Quite a number of people have joined us now. So thank you everyone who has joined us. This is a, a webinar, which is a special briefing on Victoria's parliamentary inquiry into extinction and threatened species here in Victoria. So my name is Ellen Sandal. I'm the state MP for Melbourne and I hold the environment portfolio for the Greens here in Victoria. And I'm joined by Samantha Ratnam, who's the Victorian Greens leader. And Sam is also on the inquiry, sits on the committee that's holding the inquiry. So I'll just go over what we'll cover. I'll do an acknowledgement and then we'll get straight into it. Next slide, please. Sorry, I think we're just having a bit of trouble. Slides, there we go. So thank you everyone for joining us. We will run for one hour tonight. The session will be recorded so you can share it with other people who were not able to join us today. We're going to do questions in the Q&A. So we'll have quite a big section for questions about 20 minutes at the end. For those of you who don't know as much about Zoom, just down the bottom, there's a little button that says Q&A. If you post your questions there rather than the chat, it's better because then people can actually vote up your questions and we can see the questions that people most want to answer. So if you could pop your questions in there, pop, pop them in at any time throughout the session, that'd be great. Um, if you do want to make a comment, please do feel free to use the chat. Uh, and any questions you might have after this session, please do feel free to email my office, office at ellensandals.com. We're more than happy to answer your questions. And we'd also love to hear your ideas and suggestions and what you're doing on the ground or in your organisations around conservation and threatened species here in Victoria. Next slide, please. Before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge the country that we're joining each other from. So today I'm here on Wurundjeri country, the land of the Kulin nations. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded, uh, that generations and generations of First Nations people have uh, been custodians of this land and cared for this country. And there's a lot more work to be done in terms of justice for First Nations people. Wherever you're joining us from, I'd love you to pop in the chat the country that you're on and just try and make sure that your setting is set to send messages in the chat to all panellists and attendees, maybe default set to all panellists, which means that other people in the webinar can't see your comments. So make sure it's set to all panellists and attendees. And please pop in the chat now the country that you're joining us from. Wonderful. So tonight what we'll cover is this is a special briefing to really let you in on what's happening in terms of this inquiry in Victoria. So what we'll cover are how are Victoria's ecosystems and threatened species faring, why we decided to start a parliamentary inquiry into the crisis, what we've learned through this inquiry, what's still to come, what, what more do we have to learn, what are some of the solutions that are emerging? And of course, what can each of us do to contribute to change here in Victoria? Next slide. So why is there even a parliamentary inquiry into threatened species and ecosystem collapse here in Victoria? These are just three headlines that we pulled up from the media in the recent few months. And they're pretty devastating. This is a picture of a Regent honey eater which exists in, in Victoria, New South Wales, along the East Coast. And I'm not sure if any of you saw the devastating article recently about how so many of the males of this species no longer know their own love song, their own mating song. And that's because they're not enough older males to teach those songs to the younger males. A pretty devastating impact of a loss of species. We've also seen some headlines about scientists warning us of 19 ecosystems across Australia absolutely collapsing and 13 species that have now gone extinct here in Australia. Pretty devastating statistics <coughs> and media that we're seeing. And so in the face of all of this, in the face of this devastation, in the face of all these warnings that we're hearing about ecosystem collapse and about threatened species collapse, um, here in Victoria, the Greens looked at this and thought, what more can we do? Next slide, please. And so what we decided to do was to set up a 
uh, a parliamentary inquiry. Um, but we also wanted to look at, well, what is the current situation here first? How are our ecosystems and threatened species faring in Victoria? And why do we need an inquiry to look into it? So the, one of the best pieces of information we have when it comes to threatened species and ecosystems and the environment here in Victoria is called the State of the Environment Report that many of you would be familiar with. It comes out about every four years by the Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability here in Victoria. And they look at 170 indicators of environmental health across our state. And then they use data to decide whether they're good, fair, poor, or unknown. When it comes to uh, some of these in, um, indicators are to do with things like air quality or water quality or climate change, but there's a number of them that are to do with biodiversity. And of all the biodiversity indicators, in the latest State of the Environment report, which is from two or three years ago, this is the result. None of the indicators were good, seven were fair, 21 were poor, the vast majority, and seven were unknown, including the indicator that Victorians value nature. So I think that is a pretty damning indictment on our state. I just want to run you through what some of these indicators are so you get a sense for where biodiversity is at here in Victoria right now. So on the next slide, you can see the number of the indicators um, that, that are in this biodiversity indication list. If we can go to that slide. So they're things like the distribution and abundance of fish, the distribution and abundance of frogs, of macroinvertebrates, of water birds, uh, the health and status of Ramsar wetlands, invasive species like horses and deer, invasive freshwater plants or terrestrial animals or plants. And as you can see here, a number of these indicators, they're almost all poor or unknown, only one is fair, and they're almost all deteriorating and none of them are improving. If we go to the next slide now, we can see a number of other biodiversity indicators, invertebrates, insects, landscape change, um, native vegetation, riparian health, river health, um, invertebrates and intertidal reefs. Again, as you can see, so many of these are poor. Um, most of them are deteriorating. So this is a pretty damning report, I have to say, from a number of years ago. If we go to the next slide. So looking at this from 2018, the Victorian Greens looked at this and thought, you know, obviously we are campaigning every day on things like climate change for better action on climate change and better action on our environmental issues. But we decided to use this tactic in Victorian Parliament of a parliamentary inquiry. And the reason we did that is because we know that parliamentary inquiries here in Victoria have a history of achieving outcomes. And the way that it works is there needs to be a vote in Parliament to set up the parliamentary inquiry. So that's the first head we need to go through. And then there's a committee which includes people from all different parties, Labor, Liberal, Nationals, Greens, and they actually run an inquiry into a particular topic. And what they can do is ask for submissions from the public or from organisations. Then they call witnesses, which are usually organisations or experts in the field. They then ask some questions and ultimately it ends up in a report with some recommendations. And the government then chooses whether or not to accept those recommendations. But often the government does accept those recommendations because the parliamentary inquiry has shone a spotlight on that issue. We did the same thing with at the waste crisis. You may remember a number of years ago when China stopped taking our waste and recycling here in Australia. And it, it caused a huge uproar because we realised all of a sudden that our waste was actually just getting shipped offshore and we weren't recycling it here. So what the Greens did is we managed to use our numbers in Parliament to pass an inquiry into the waste crisis. And that inquiry looked at some of the problems and the barriers. It came up with some recommendations that then the government ended up adopting and really not just adopting, but embracing. And so things like now we're getting separate glass bins, a cash for cans scheme, all of these came from that inquiry. So we're hoping that here in Victoria, if we can shine a light on what is actually going on here with, with biodiversity and threatened species, but then we can make some recommendations that the government hopefully does actually adopt. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to hand over to Samantha Ratnam, who's the leader of the Victorian Greens and actually sits on this inquiry. What she'll do is run us through how does it work and which witnesses we've heard so far. What are we hearing about the evidence and what are we hearing about some of the emerging solutions? And then we'll talk about how you can contribute to some of those solutions. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to everyone to put something in the chat 
we could. What I'd like to know is who you are and what brought you here today. In particular, I'm interested to know what kind of work you do on conservation and threatened species. Um, I know a lot of people here might be in their local land care group, they might be part of an organisation, an NGO or a community group that does work on, um, on threatened species, on conservation, on regeneration, on planting, whatever it is, we'd really like to know who you are so that we can get a sense of the kind of content that you're interested in tonight. So please put it in the chat and please make sure you set, set it to all panellists and attendees so that everyone can see it. So while you do that, I'll hand over to Samantha Rudd. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, uh, hi, everyone. It's really great to be joining you and thank you so much for your interest uh, in both the inquiry and protecting our environment in general. I'm uh, joining you from Wurundjeri country today and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the different First Nations land uh, from which we all gather here today on this really, really important topic. Thank you, Ellen, for that really good oversight and overview of the nature of the problem and how we've got to a parliamentary inquiry. And I'm going to take you through now a little bit about where we're at in the process of the inquiry and then get into what we're hearing so far. And it's been pretty interesting and I um, hope to be able to give you some insights and some observations um, from what's been happening to date and happy to take some questions on this as well. Next slide, please. Um, and just to add to what Ellen mentioned as well, in terms of the process of the inquiry, they're really important. They do shape the work of a parliament. They can really change how a government approaches an issue. And that's what we're hoping for with this inquiry. It's interesting to note that on this committee, the Planning and Environment Committee that's looking into um, uh, threatened species and biodiversity, it's one of the biggest committees. So there's 10 people on the committee. It's got a really broad range of the political spectrum uh, represented on it. So we've got, you know, three... Um, members of the government from the Labor Party, we've got a Liberal National, uh, somebody from Sustainable Australia Party, someone from the Shooters and Fishers Party, of course the Greens, uh, we've got an Independent um, and Animal Justice Party, if I mentioned that as well. So we've got quite a broad range of people represented, which is a really good thing because you get different perspectives, but it's also worth noting that with that you can't get quite different interests as well and different areas that people want to look into a bit more detail and some of those are really competing interests so I'll go to I'll go through that in just a, in just a tick so a bit about where we're at so in June 2019 is when the Greens pushed for this inquiry and we got that passed through the upper house of parliament uh, it was established in October 2019 and submissions opened in June of last year and of course um, COVID had its impact and slowed things down a little bit but we're back um, back on track now um, to have this inquiry really investigate this thoroughly. Uh, submissions closed in August 2020 uh, and we started hearings at the end of last year and we'll um, still move through hearings and hearing from witnesses right through to the middle um, of this year. We anticipate that the report and the work of the committee will conclude uh, about two thirds of the way through this year. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, despite we had COVID having an impact like it did in all aspects of our life, it did delay uh, some of the process, but it didn't stop. Uh, the interest in this inquiry from the Victorian Committee. In fact, the committee was overwhelmed by uh, submissions. We're, we've received 956 submissions to date, which is quite considerable. And uh, they really range in the different inquiries in terms of how many submissions you get. So this is one of the bigger ones and the committee are quite aware of that. And it really told us that Victorians really care about the future of our special places and creatures. On this slide, you'll see some quotes of submissions that we've received. They're just two examples where people have given us permission, but there have been so many poignant stories that people have shared with us and that just highlighted how deep our connection is as a community to the places we live and visit and want to protect. Uh, the committee has also received close to 100 submissions from organisations um, with knowledge, specific knowledge and insights uh, from really a range of perspectives about what's happening across the state. We've heard from wildlife shelters, environmental lawyers, ecologists, uh, local community land care groups, threatened species scientists, and many, many more. And I know a number of them, uh, of those groups are here with us today as well, which is really great. One of the really fantastic things about a parliamentary inquiry is that they create space for so many people to share their passion and wealth of knowledge, which is really useful uh, for MPs. And it really does shape the way our members of parliament think about an issue. 
And in addition to these individual and organisational submissions, the committees received close to 3,000 form submissions from people who've added their names, uh, for example, to calls of organisations like Environmental Justice Australia. And what that does is really tell the committee there's really big community interest in this issue. And by the time submissions closed in August, the committee and secretariat really were in no doubt about the community's concern and desire for solutions in this area. Next slide, please. So uh, a little bit of a snapshot of what, who we've heard from so far and some of the things that we've gleaned. So far, we've heard from government agencies, uh, the key coordinating agencies, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, but we've also heard from the Commission for Environmental Sustainability, who prepares a state of environment report that Ellen referred to before, Parks Victoria, the Office of the Conservation Regulator and Vic Forests. In addition to government agencies, we've heard from quite a number of wildlife groups, including Wildlife Victoria, the Australian Wildlife Society, uh, the Australian Wildlife Protection Council and the RSPCA and more. We've heard from several threatened species experts, uh, including Melbourne University's Professor Brendan Wintle and the Threatened Species Conservancy. And invasive species has been a big theme so far with witnesses from the Invasive Species Council, the Deer Association and more speaking to this. Finally, we've had a fairly robust day recently focused on native forest logging with witnesses from the logging industry, uh, from the field and forest ecology research fields and from forest advo advocacy groups such as Friends of Leadbeater's Possum and the Wilderness Society. If you're particularly keen, uh, details of all the witnesses, hearing transcripts are all published on the Parliament's website. Uh, and while I know it sounds like we've covered a lot of ground, and we have already, there's still a lot more to come and we're about a third of the way through uh, our hearings. Uh, in the upcoming hearings, we'll hear from land care and conservation groups, including the Nature Conservancy and the Victorian National Parks Association. We'll hear from a range of First Nations groups from across the state, and we're doing regional hearings as well, um, as well as more scientists and organisations with expertise in our river and marine ecosystems. And the, uh, as I mentioned, the committee will be undertaking regional, regional hearings and site visits, which is also really important about bringing life to some of the programs we're, to, we're hearing about that are having an impact in a positive way. Uh, so at this point, I just wanted to share with you some of what we've learned in this inquiry so far through both the research uh, the committee secretariat has done, but also the submissions and the hearings. And I'll um, try and give you a bit of a sense of where things are kind of headed as well. Next slide, please. So what we've learned so far, uh, well, we've really probed and the committee is getting a much stronger understanding of what is actually driving the decline in our ecosystems and species in Victoria. So key drivers are climate change and altered fire regimes, invasive species, weeds and animals, logging and land clearing for development. So habitat loss really coming through as a very significant theme. And I'll briefly cover each of these in a bit more detail in a moment. We've also heard a lot about what the Victorian government is doing with some really fascinating insights into what's working and also what's not working. And finally, we're getting a sense of the barriers to improving the outlook for Victoria's biodiversity. I think it'll take to the end of the process to really understand this one because there is an interrelationship between a number of factors, but I'll certainly share what we are seeing so far. So firstly on, um, invasive species and weeds and introduced animals. It's a big part of the discussion uh, for hearings at the end of February and something many of the committee are particularly interested in. Introduced plants and animals in Victoria are a big problem with 21 of the 43 threatened species listed under Victoria's environmental laws relating to invasive species. Many witnesses have shared the inadequacy of funding for Parks Victoria and other agencies to manage invasive species, particularly weeds. There are examples where community groups uh, had to take matters into their own hands and fund invasive species management because they knew that the agencies responsible for it just didn't have the resources. So that was quite eye-opening for the committee. And it's all been quite clear that Victoria has not done a good job of managing invasive species early. And you've got to manage them early if you want to manage them well. We've also heard evidence that our approach to invasive species ma management is driven by politics as much as or more than the evidence at times. For example, the failure to manage feral deer because of the influence of the hunting lobby who benefit from, benefit from deer in the environment and the wild dog, dog programs, which kill many dingoes, a threatened species, despite dogs um, being low in the order of actual threats to threatened species, are just examples of some of the politics interfering with actually good management of our invasive species. 
climate change and altered fire regimes, once again, coming up as a really dominant theme that we're all aware of. Almost every submission and witness has identified climate change as a key driver of environmental decline. I won't cover this in too much detail as it's an area we could spend hours on alone, but a few key things have come up that are worth pointing to. Of particular concern are the impacts of climate change not being linear. And what I mean is that what I mean by that is how dramatically single events or small shifts can cause really significant changes. For example, Wildlife Victoria presented some very concerning evidence um, about the impact of extreme heat days on key species like flying foxes. These events can kill up to a third of individuals in a species in a single event and cause mass abandonment of young. Likewise, uh, the witness from Parks Victoria spoke about our mountain ash forests and the way that the frequency of fires where they happen too um, often means trees don't reach maturity, don't seed, and we lose the whole ecosystem. Next slide, please. Native forest logging. Uh, It's something the committee has heard a lot about. We heard a lot about uh, it from the industry as well, which was a very, very interesting day, very tense day at the committee as well. Um, We heard from Vic Forest, the state-owned logging agency, the Office of the Conservation Regulator, who's responsible for regulating Vic Forests. We heard, um, we heard from wildlife crime and other conservation uh, about wildlife crime and other conservation issues. Multiple industry logging groups were leading forest scientists, Professor David Lindenmeyer, and from community advocacy groups such as Friends of Leadbeater's Possum. This day of witnesses was particularly valuable for members of the committee with, who didn't have a strong pre-existing view on native forest logging. The inquiry provided the forum for leading conservation experts to challenge the claims coming from the logging industry. And it was really interesting to hear the logging industry at the start of the day making these kind of outrageous claims only to be counted um, really strongly by experts in the field. People have been doing research in this area for years who could categorically um, uh, uh, undercut or basically um, pick holes in the arguments that the industry have been spouting for many years that we've known about. The few key takeaways from these hearings, um, the logging industry claims that native forest logging has no impact on threatened species. That's what I mean by an outrageous claim, and they kept making this claim right throughout the day. Then Professor Lindenmeyer um, effectively refuted this with really extensive evidence of more than 70 forest-dependent species who are threatened by logging, the evidence being really clear. The Office of the Conservation Regulator has found Vic Forest in breach of laws multiple times, but has not once issued anything stronger than a warning letter against the agency. So that tells you the problem with the enforcement of what laws are supposed to protect our environment. Next slide, please. Land clearing and development, so habitat loss, once again, a really significant theme. Um, And we know Victoria has a fundamentally changed landscape since colonisation. Historic land clearing has contributed to many of the challenges we're seeing today, but continues to, uh, remains a continuing driver. Some of the key witnesses presented on this um, include uh, the Ecological Association of Victoria, who gave evidence of their firsthand experiencing development outcomes trump ecological ones time after time. We heard from Environmental Justice Australia, who made an important point about the role of the state as one of the major contributors to land clearing. So these are state sanctioned projects that aren't doing the right thing. And the ecologists were really powerful in being able to um, um, kind of create a picture for us about what happens within the process and how often the evidence is just leaned over. They present the evidence and still the project goes ahead. This image of um, clearing of red gums along the Western Highway duplication is just a case in point of a number of these types of projects that are really driving habitat loss. Um, So I'm now moving on to what we're hearing about what the Victorian government is doing and how effective we're hearing it is. Uh, So I've covered off in some of the areas we're seeing about threats uh, through the inquiry. Uh, Some of the stuff that we're hearing about what government agencies are doing, um, we've heard some good examples, but it's also become quite clear that there's kind of a lack of urgency and ambition to address biodiversity loss from the state, essentially. Um, It just doesn't seem like it's enough of a priority for government, and therefore it's not filtering it down to the department and the people who are responsible for being on the ground um, and actually um, helping to protect our environment in a range of those areas. There's also what seems to be an incomplete framework to have an impact. So we've heard about the need for landscape approaches, but also targeted species approach. And Victoria doesn't seem to be doing 
both those approaches in tandem. It chooses one over the other with quite serious consequences when you actually don't look at doing everything you know could be effective. Um, talking about what the go government has set up and we've heard from the department uh, regarding this. So the Victorian government's current framework for addressing the state's declining ecosystems is a 20 year biodiversity strategy, biodiversity strategy 2037. This was a 2014 election commitment from the Labor government. The strategy received funding of around $100 million when it was announced, although that funding concludes in June 2021. Subsequent budgets have provided additional funding, although it's quite piecemeal for different activities like deer management and response to bushfires. Um, and many of the witnesses to date have commented that the biodiversity strategy um, is kind of good in terms of setting up vision and goals of the strategy being valid but the implementation of activities to actually achieve these goals is lacking. There's also poor transparency and accountability. We don't have the measures in place to know if we've actually reached our goals and that if the strategy is to actually achieve change, it needs substantially more funding in the order of billions, not millions. And we've been really trying to ask questions about how the strategy is being funded and you kind of get lots of applications, but that's one of the jobs of the inquiry is to find out if this strategy is actually funded properly and if not, how much it's going to take to fund it properly to reach its outcomes. Um, so the other area that we're looking at um, uh, is nature and wildlife laws and regulation. And so this is coming up as a really key theme. So along with direct action through funded research programs and activities, this is another key tool that governments have to protect and even restore our ecosystems and threatened species. So it affects both the laws and the bodies that are designed to enforce these laws. It's coming through loud and clear that many of our nature laws are inadequate, both in themselves and their enforcement. Firstly, our laws for protecting threatened species, the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act, are essentially discretionary. They'd be okay if they were actually implemented, but they're not. Even worse are our wildlife laws. These are extremely old and have some very perverse aspects. For example, native animals can be killed and are with a very loose permit system, while invasive animals like deer continue to be treated as a protected game species. And there was a very interesting exchange at the committee when the committee was actually trying to get their head around these really confusing laws. And it really brought home that they're so confusing that it took so many experts trying to explain to the committee and still the committee isn't clear about their interaction. So it's a really big area we're looking into. And also importantly, we've heard from many witnesses about the inadequacy of the current regulation and enforcement of laws, largely by the Office of the Conservation Regulator. And we've got a couple of committee members who are really pursuing this. So that's um, a really good outcome so far of the inquiry. Um, so just to, I guess, in summary, what's emerging so far, um, we've heard kind of loud and clear through the inquiry that many people in our community are really concerned about what's happening. We know that awareness is growing, especially after events like the Black Summer, but solving the challenge we face needs us all to be active and champions for a thriving future. And the examples that we've heard of programs that have worked in other states are ones where the community is actively involved and given good pathways to take care of the environment, as well as the state doing its job uh, and you know implementing its responsibility of which it has a huge responsibility so having heard now from many of the government agencies and a number of important experts it's clear that the current government response to the victorian extinction crisis is fundamentally inadequate we've heard across the board from conservation groups to the deer hunting lobby that agencies like parks victoria are desperately underfunded Achieving the goals of the biodiversity strategy will require orders of magnitude more funding, ongoing funding, and the real prioritising of ecosystems and wildlife outcomes by this and future Victorian governments. We're less than halfway through the hearings, but we've already seen those who benefit and profit from environmental exploitation try and confuse issues and play down their role. The native forest logging industry, um, sorry, sorry, the native forest logging industry and hunting lobby groups are just key examples. We've seen that so far. Finally, we're starting to see some of the solutions also presented, both big and small, and this is a really hopeful part of the inquiry. Uh, we've heard about major challenges uh, like climate crisis, um, taking tectonic shifts in our, uh, in our economy away from fossil fuels and petrol transport um, to actually have an impact. 
but other solutions are also, are also simpler, effective and ready to go. And they're ready to be scaled up if there was government will and commitment and funding. So I'll now hand back to Ellen to cover off on a couple of these. And as I know that solutions are um, something she's really passionate about and really happy to take some questions later on. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Samantha. So I know that was a lot of information um, hopefully that was useful to you um, I just encourage everyone to put your questions in the Q&A box because we'd love to spend most of the rest of the time that we have on your questions so that we can really get into what you're interested in exploring so chuck something in the Q&A a question or something you'd like us to explore further so if we move on to the next slide um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some of the solutions that are emerging so obviously ecosystem collapse Extinction, threatened species um, are these huge problems with lots of interconnected elements. Um, and But here in Victoria, we really want to figure out what are the things that the Victorian government could do right now that would make the biggest bang for buck. And some of these solutions will be very politically contentious. So things like ending logging or ending land clearing to build roads, um, some of these things are things that the government here in Victoria, the Labor government has just really dug their heels on and we hope we can get them to change their mind, but it's difficult because they want to push ahead. Whereas there are some other solutions that are things that uh, the barriers to them aren't as high. They're not necessarily political problems. They're just that perhaps Victoria doesn't have enough funding or the coordination is not quite right or it's not prioritised enough in government and we can shine a spotlight on it and get government to prioritise it a little bit more. Um, or there are some programs that are just flying under the radar that need more funding and attention. So we're hoping to find some of these solutions that the Victorian government can fund in their upcoming budgets and even take to the election. So one such program that we think is worth exploring is the Trust for Nature's Revolving Fund. Many of you may know about this already. It's a fund that um, money goes into the fund and then they buy up parcels of land that have high biodiversity values. And then they put a covenant on them so that they're protected and then they on sell them to people who then have to abide by that covenant and so then they get their money back and then they can go and buy more land put a covenant on it and it revolves and so it expands the private conservation estate and the reason this is so important is because we know that victoria is the state that is the most cleared of any state or territory in australia which is pretty flabbergasting i have to say it's so cleared and most of the conservation we think of happening on public land in places like national parks. But in fact, some of the most precious ecosystems are little remnants of bushland that exist on private property, on farmland or in people's backyards or on bush properties. We need a way to protect those as well. And so private land conservation is an area where potentially it's not as politically contentious as something like ending logging, that if we could say get more funding into trust for nature, that might be one way, there might be other ways as well to get more conservation on private land. If we move to the next slide, we talk about a program that exists in New South Wales that I think could be a good model for us here in Victoria and something we've heard a bit about during the inquiry. So currently in Victoria, we have a list of all the threatened species in Victoria, and then we're supposed to have plans against each of those threatened species that look at what's putting them at risk and what we're going to do about it. But in fact, we have so little funding for this and it's not very well done and not very well coordinated that many of those threatened species don't even have a plan and even fewer of them are funded. In New South Wales, by contrast, they've got a much better system and it's a, very, it's a similar system. They have a list of threatened species, they have a plan and funding associated, but it's much more transparent. You can actually go on their website, the Save Our Species New South Wales website, and you can see all the threatened species and then you can see what are the threats to that species, how much money the government has put towards addressing that threat and who their partners have been. And their partner might be a zoo or a local community group and who's been given that money to do it and what the outcomes were. They actually track the outcomes and see whether it's improving. We don't have nearly that amount of transparency here in Victoria. And also that money, just that program actually just has a lot more funding associated with it. It's just had an independent review and we believe that that review will show that it's effective and that it should be extended. So we'll be hearing from New South Wales at the inquiry soon. And could we look at a program like this here in Victoria, where we have a bit more funding, a bit more coordination, a bit more transparency around threatened species, and actually get a good outcome for something that's not that politically contested? 
move on to the next slide, please. And of course, we still need to tackle some of the big issues, things like logging, land clearing, climate change, obviously, is the biggest driver of threatened species and invasive species is probably the next biggest driver. So we do need to tackle these big issues and the inquiry will be looking at this as well. Move on to the next slide, please. So here are these we've heard tonight about what are some of the barriers, what's, what's going wrong in Victoria. And part of that is the government actually driving extinction, but part of it's also just poor coordination lack of funding, lack of transparency that's leading to these problems. We've heard how bad the problem is, which is really bad. And we've heard that there might be some solutions that the government could easily adopt. But these solutions won't be adopted just because the government wakes up one day and decides to do them. That's why the parliamentary inquiry is shining a light on them. But we still need a bit of a push from the community to get some of these solutions over the line. So what you can all do, many of you I know have already made submissions, your organisations have made submissions that are incredibly, incredibly valuable. And most submissions, I think of almost any inquiry in, in Victorian Parliament. But we still need a little bit more support. And probably the best thing that you can do right now is to email your local MP, lower house and upper house, about the inquiry. Because the last thing we want is for all of this great information to fly under the radar and the government feels like there's not enough pressure to act. What we want is to replicate what happened with the waste inquiry where they felt so much pressure to act and then they could just pick up the recommendations from the inquiry and fund them and implement them. So if you can email your local MP, lower house and upper house, you'll have five upper house MPs. You can find them on this link. We'll put this link in the chat and we'll also send an email follow up to you. All you need to do is send them a very thoughtful, quick, unique email that just says who you are, why you care about the environment, that you're following the inquiry and you'd love for them to keep you updated. And what this does is then your local MP might not even know the inquiry is happening and then they go, oh, I should find out what's going on with that inquiry. They'll email their, their Labor counterpart, for example, on the inquiry and say, can you keep me updated? And then they'll have to get back to you. And so it just puts a bit of pressure on the committee to know that people are watching and on your local MPs to know that people are watching. So this is an incredibly effective thing that you can do over the coming weeks. Next slide, please. You can also follow the inquiry. There's a break now, but there'll be more hearings coming up after Easter. Uh, you can follow it online, but you can also just follow Sam and I on Twitter. We'll be tweeting about it if you just want the summarised version. Next slide, please. And spread the word, tell your friends, family, other people that might be in your local land crew group or your local bush group, um, tell them to also email the MP or sign up um, here to receive more updates about what's happening. So thank you so much for listening. Um, please do email me office at ellensandwell.com if there's anything we haven't covered or if you'd like to let us know what you're doing. We do have a number of questions in the chat, which is great. But I'm gonna go through some of them now. Um, all right, so we've got a good question here from Donna Lee. There is a global call for 30% of land and sea to be put aside for nature. More than 50 countries have signed on with the US announcing a few weeks ago um, that it will make it a priority but Australia only has 4% protected. How can we join the global call to act? Uh, I'm happy to take this question. Yes, Australia has not nearly enough protected land. It's, it's absolutely outrageous. As I mentioned, Victoria is the um, one of the most cleared states. It is the most cleared state in the country and Australia has a very poor environmental record in terms of active land clearing. Um, what I was quite disappointed by when I came to Parliament in 2014, about six years ago, was that even this Labor Victorian government actually came to the election with a policy of no more new marine protected areas. And they actually have the lowest record of new national park creation of any government in Victoria's history. So that's pretty damning really to say that they've created fewer national parks than any government and they're actively saying no more marine parks because they want to appease the recreational fishers. And so we do have a lot of work to do 
to get our governments to realise that people value this and will actually vote accordingly. So the way that we're going to change this is just by constant campaigning and letting, letting governments know that we do not support those policies which allow more clearing and, and less protection. Unfortunately, it's as simple as that. It's a political question. Um, I've got one for you, Sam, here from Kate, who says, local government has a big impact on environmental values and protection or destruction. Has this been addressed? Great question. Thanks, Ellen. It was from Kate, wasn't it? Um, really good question. We haven't heard from a lot, haven't heard a lot from local government as yet, but we are in future hearings. So I suspect that's going to be an area that we canvass a lot more. It has come through a couple of times when committee members have been asking some of the experts that we've had before us about the different roles of the different levels of government. Uh, so it is something we're going to be exploring more of. It's also worth noting you know, what we do in Victoria also is impacted by uh, federal environmental laws, and we know there's a heap of work to be done there as well. At the same time, one of the tasks, I think, before the committee is to really make sure that we really can look properly at what the state can do, like everything the state can do, and not let the state off the hook because it often will like to say, oh, that's a local government responsibility or that's a federal government responsibility, therefore we don't have to do our part. So one of the big jobs we have as the committee is to make sure that we look properly at what the state should be doing, the full expansive nature of um, things it should be funding, laws it should be implementing, laws it should be helping fund, implement and enforce as well, uh, so that it doesn't pass the buck to local government. So we, we will be talking to local government and looking at that, but also at the same time, making sure that we don't see the same uh, playbook being used often by governments, which is to say, oh, it's somebody else's responsibility, we're going to pass the buck. So holding that tension at the moment as well. Thank you, Sam. Um, another one for you, Sam. Um, Nick says, could you tell us which committee members are further investigating the Office of the Conservation Regulator? Oh, um, true. Good question. Um, so everyone's taken interest in it, um, but Stuart Grimley, who's one of the participating members, has been asking a lot of follow-up questions. So it's really interesting with the committee you'll get a sense for anyone listening to their hearings, you'll start to get a bit of a sense of things that each of the committee members is particularly passionate about or starting to pursue. Um, and my sense is that Stuart came into it with a very open mind and it's really piqued his interest about what's happening with the um, Office of the Conservation Regulator and how it can be strengthened. So it's something that, you know, the whole committee is asking about, but I've definitely noticed that Stuart's taken a particular interest. And he's one of the crossbenchers, is that right, Sam? Yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah, is he from a party? Uh, he's a Darren Hinge Justice Party MP. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be a bit cheeky now and get one of my staff members on the line. So my staff member Fern um, in my office is our resident guru when it comes to environmental policy. And there's a couple of questions here that I know that she's been working on. So rather than getting me to answer them, I might get her to answer them. Uh, the first one was from David. What is the status of legislative changes enabling the Vic Attorney General to block legal actions against big forests? I'm not sure if you know this one. If you don't, Fern, that's, we can look into it later. Um, thank you for the question. I am actually not familiar with that, but I would be very happy if you want to send us an email to that office at ellensandell.com email address to, um, to look into it and get back to you. This was, I think, um, relating to um, the Victorian government potentially introducing new laws that makes it much harder to take legal action against Vic Forests because Vic Forests, which is our state-owned logging agency for people who don't know, um, has, as Sam mentioned, um, been breaking the law and getting away with it and in fact been breaking federal environment law and have been taken to court and found to be in breach, which then stopped logging in a number of areas in Victoria. And the Victorian government's response to this rather than saying, hey, Vic Forest, obey the law is to essentially change the law. Um, that hasn't come to the upper house yet, but our understanding is that it will come. Sometime. Yeah, so that's a bill that's been sitting in the upper house for a little while now, and we, we are looking into it closely with groups like Environment Justice Australia, and we'll, yeah, we'll certainly be, um, you know, taking a close look and doing all that we can to make sure that those legal avenues that groups have been using are still a still really important tool for actually enforcing the laws that we, where we have them that can achieve outcomes for our forests and our threatened species. Thanks Fern. Another one for you um, about camping on waterways. So this is from Margaret. She says she's interested in the government consultation on access to campers on natural waterways. So this is to do with 
some laws that the government um, put in recently, uh, allowing, wanting to allow camping on all river frontages in Victoria. So Margaret says she has a property on a creek in northeast Victoria, and recently with her neighbour has undertaken a major regeneration project with considerable contribution of labour and funds. Um, do you intend to address any of these issues? Do you have any tips for those of us who wish to contribute to the process? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question, Margaret. Um, this was a quite a, a, a reform that the Labor government um, committed to coming up to the last election. And it was essentially something that they did in support of the recreational fishing lobby. And that's a group that has quite a lot of influence um, in Victorian politics. And going back to what Ellen said about marine protected areas, again, like recreational fishing, not that, you know, we don't like, there isn't a place for that, but this government has been particularly pushing reforms to allow increased recreational fishing. And um, this was a commitment that was made without much thought and certainly without consultation like land, with landholders like yourself about actually what are the practical implications of opening up all these areas of land along rivers um, for camping and fishing. And there was quite a spirited debate, which Samantha was part of in the upper house, um, with quite a lot of voices asking really valid questions like what about fire and what about the regeneration I've done and what about illegal use of firearms and just many valid concerns raised. So where that sat um, the Victorian Fisheries Authority is currently coordinating the kind of feedback from the community on how that reform is implemented. And that consultation is open right now. And Ellen and Samantha uh, sought brief briefing from the department last year and um, the Department of Environment is really wanting to hear from people about, you know, whether or not they are supportive of this reform. It is now something the government's implementing, but they're very aware of regeneration work and that sort of thing and want to ensure as best they can that the rules around where the camping is allowed and not allowed are the kind of can be the best. So I really encourage you not only to have your input through the official consultation process, but again, contacting your local MP and also the environment minister so that you know your concerns are heard in a number of places. I think that's the best avenue we have for making sure these reforms, which perhaps weren't that well thought through, can be the best that they can now. Thank you, Fern. That's really comprehensive. Thank you. So Can I just add something so really quickly, Ellen, as well, um, just on top of that. So absolutely agree with all um, Fern's suggestions there. It's been interesting. It's come up a couple of times in the hearing so far with uh, a couple of committee members asking a few, a few witnesses about it. We haven't really got to the bottom of it. They you know, run out of time and it felt like there was a bit of interference being run that people didn't want to hear the answers. But it really is speaking to this kind of a little bit of this set and forget kind of approach that the government sometimes takes. It makes all these changes. It says it sees them as incremental changes, but we know they add up to huge biodiversity loss. So it'll make a change here and then won't think about the implications, you know, at the opposite end of the spectrum. And this is one of those examples of the kind of approach the government has taken, which has got us into this situation in the first place. So we'll, we'll pursue it as well. Thank you, Sam. Um, a good question here from Roger. Does the inquiry look at biodiversity in urban areas? If so, I have a major issue with domestic cats. Cats wreak havoc on wildlife in urban areas. Um, he's suggesting minimum statewide cat curfews, ideally in suspect cats decent in housing enclosures. Um, I know that we did hear <coughs> quite extensively from a number of invasive species, apologies, <coughs> um, experts. Sam, you want to talk about that? Yes, yeah, so it's uh, certainly coming up as um, quite a, a big issue. We are talking um, a lot about cats and we're talking about urban environments. We're having more uh, witnesses who specialise in urban environments um, ahead in the schedules. I think they'll be towards kind of the June time, but it's certainly an area that the inquiry is looking into and we haven't just we haven't canvassed it properly, but it's already coming up as an issue and we're um, therefore asking, you know, the witnesses and experts as well for some of the solutions and um, that need to be on the table. So watch yeah, this space. I think invasive species are becoming a much um, more well understood threat um, and beyond just weeds. Um, obviously, cats is a huge one. 
foxes, rabbits, deer, I mean, deer are just out of control across the whole state and even some non-traditional allies like um, in rural areas are getting really up in arms about deer because of the dangers. Um, and so I think that this inquiry will have a very large recommendation section on invasive species and take your point around cats. I very much encourage you to email your MP, lower upper house and the committee members about that because I think they need to hear more of those kind of um, concerns from the community because often they'll probably be hearing the other side. Um, Kate had another good one, which is private land is critical to our environmental values and habitat. Is it being addressed? We're constantly seeing unnecessary loss of habitat on private property and roadsides with no enforcement from council. Sam, is this something that's been canvassed already in the inquiry? Uh, yes, we've started looking into it a bit, but it is definitely an area that we're going to be looking at a lot more. And we're going to be doing some site visits um, on this topic as well. So, and we're going to have a day of experts um, in terms of private land conservation work as well. So it's going to come through through that plus the urban environments, I suspect. So um, another one there committee's going to look at it a little bit more deeply. Um, a good one here from Jill. Does the Office of the um, Conservation Regulator have its own legislative powers? Where do these conflict with existing laws, um, which is subordinate? Fern might, have, um, yeah, Fern's probably yeah, a good, good one to, to look at this. I know Fern's probably been talking to you a little bit, Jill, about this. Um, yeah, great question. And look, it has been really interesting in the inquiry to actually dig a bit into this, um, this body, the Office of Conservation Regulator, because they're relatively new in Victoria. They were actually set up out of a previous parliamentary inquiry that looked at the failed regulation of the logging industry and the government's response was to set up this Office of Conservation Regulator. Uh, but it sits within the existing Department of Environment and we've seen already through the inquiry that the regulator, first of all, it doesn't have legislative powers at the moment. There's some that um, are in the upper house, which it may, may get, but even with that, the evidence we're hearing suggests that those powers are inadequate and won't resolve the conflict between, between the, basically essentially the, the government and, um, and our ecosystems and um, several witnesses have called for if we're really serious about actually prioritizing protecting ecosystems and threatened species that we need a truly independent conservation regulator um, something a bit more like the EPA but not just on its own one also that has the courage and the willingness to actually take on the government aware the government is doing the wrong thing does that answer that, Ellen? I think so, yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, Jill, please get in touch with us if you want to keep talking about it. I'm, I'm sure that you will. It's something that we'll, we're keeping very much an eye on. Um, I mean, it's just a, it seems to, be, to me that um, the forest issue, the government's is trying everything they can to let big forests keep logging and they just keep putting up these tiny little barriers that are very easy for the for big forests to jump over to look like they're doing something, but ultimately their interest is not in having big forests obey the law, their interest is in letting big forests do whatever they like. Um, sorry to be a little bit cynical about that. Um, Kate had a really good question here about um, the national parks in Victoria, saying that Parks Victoria and the department are failing to follow through and even going against the VIAC recommendations for Yellingbo. So what this is, is there are a number of areas that um, when the government goes to create a new national park, usually they Commission VIAC, which is the Environmental Assessment Council, to, to recommend areas of national park, and then the government adopts those recommendations or not. And so VIAC recommend a, a bunch of areas in the central west of the state to become national parks, and the government has really delayed actually implementing that. Um, this is probably another one for Fern, who knows a little bit more detail than us, but I know that we have been pushing and pushing and pushing for the government to follow through on these recommendations. I have personally talked to the minister about it. I've personally talked to the minister's chief of staff about it. And what they told me is that it was a budgeting issue, that they couldn't, that they didn't have enough budget for it. But I note in your question, Kate, you're saying that's actually not, not the case. Um, I also don't believe it's the case. Um, that's what they're telling us. 
Um, so we will be looking very closely in the upcoming budget because they've assured me that they, they think they've been able to overcome some of those budgetary issues. But just look at the last budget, they can spend billions and billions on COVID recovery appropriately, but there's no lack of funds for this kind of thing. It's more a lack of will. Do you have anything to add to that, Fern? Um, only that um, your limbo, I think, was one which may actually soon be added to the protected area or state through new legislation um, that passed at the end of last year, which was ironically the same legislation that included the river camping stuff. So often the government does this where they put quite good things in the same bill or laws as things that are more controversial. Um, but having said that, like Ellen said, there's big areas in the central west of Victoria, which are last remaining bits of habitat and a bunch of other recommendations for areas that need to be put into the public land conservation estate that the government's known about for years and years and is still just sitting on actually actioning that. Thanks, Fern. Um, I've just got time for one more. David said, how do we get Parks Victoria better funded? They're now privatising some park areas in order to get funding for themselves, hence pub public parkland is diminishing. Absolutely. This is a campaign the Greens have actually been running for some time. Um, Five years ago, I started um, the campaign to get more funding for Parks Victoria. Um, the funding was cut severely under the Liberal, the Bailey Napthine government. It has been incrementally increasing over the years. So every, every budget, they just get a little bit more, but never enough to be sufficient, uh, particularly given the scale of challenge around invasive species that they have. Um, we managed in a negotiation with the government a couple of years ago, I think 2017 it was, to get money for um, 130 new park ranges across the state as part of our negotiations with the government on um, a minor um, treasury tax bill, which was a good start. And we continue to pursue it every budget, asking for more money for Parks Victoria. But I actually think that's part of the reason we did this inquiry is we have been pushing so many of these issues for so many years and we needed to try a new tactic. Say, how do we build some political consensus around this, shine a spotlight on the issues, get some experts telling the government what needs to happen rather than it just being us. And so Parks Victoria funding will absolutely, I imagine, be in the recommendations. I mean, Samantha, you can't say yet um, what will be in the recommendations, but I imagine that that's coming through quite strongly. All right, well, that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. For the questions we didn't get to, please feel free to email us and we will get back to you. And just a reminder to please email your local and upper house member of parliament. It can be as simple as saying, I understand there's an inquiry into habitat loss ecosystem decline happening in Victoria. Can you please keep me updated? I'm very interested in this. I'd love to see some positive change happen. Just an MP getting 10 of those emails from their local constituents. I guarantee you, then they'll feel compelled to do something about it. The environment here in Victoria and environmental policy has gone under the radar, unfunded and unloved for far too long. We need to turn this around, but unfortunately the only way we do that is through people contacting the government and demanding it to happen. So we'll continue to do our work in parliament. Hopefully you'll continue to do your work, your brilliant work out there in the community and um, continue to contact your MPs and try and get them to do better as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, everyone.